So we'll have three different sections. The one is to see how uh, exercise efficiency is impaired in patients with diabetes. The second one is how exercise can actually prevent diabetes, and this is uh, very important in the patients that are pre-diabetic. And then how uh, the beneficial effect of exercise in patients with diabetes. So these are data from the US, and we know that 58% uh, only of the American adults are physically active. But when you actually consider just the population with type 2 diabetes, this is reduced to 39% of uh, um, physical activity. So there's definitely a link between um, a physical activity and diabetes. But um, I've, I've mentioned it uh, yesterday. You have 25 millions of people with uh, type 2 diabetes in the US. But most importantly, you have 75 million people that actually are pre-diabetic. So these people have an elevated uh, blood glucose, but not high enough to actually be diabetic. And these are the values where we consider that you are pre-diabetic is that your fasting glucose level will be between 100 and 125 milligram per deciliter. So this is a very important category of patients because this is really, you want to try to limit the development of diabetes in these patients. And you can do that with exercise. And if you look here on the right side, the graph on the right side, it shows that really a physical activity can really develop the risk of developing diabetes, up to 50%. So, and this is not strenuous uh, activity. If you look, you start from 500 kilocalories of exercise per week and down to 3,500 kilocalories. So 3,500 per week, so for seven days. So it is really... Uh, remarkable that you can actually decrease your risk by 50% if you exercise uh, a risk. And there is actually a, a, fin a study that has been conducted in Finland where they tried to, it's a very large clinical trial, where they tried to see uh, whether by increasing the uh, physical activity by only three hours per week. So, not not intense physical activity, just moderate leisure activity, physical activity, they observe a 70% risk reduction uh, for diabetes compared to the one who didn't exercise. So it's a major, major way to limit uh, the development of diabetes. However, on the opposite, there is uh, a direct correlation between watching TV and the development of diabetes. And if you, if you consider every two hours of watching TV per day, you increase your risk of developing type 2 diabetes by up to 20% in adults. So two hours is only one movie. <laughs> so, and today we talk about TV. Uh, TV, think of cell phones, think of tablets, of computers. Yeah. Okay, so that's, that's a very good question because um, we think that it's mainly because you don't exercise, you don't do anything, you just sit on the couch, but uh, there might be other factors and we see that there might be some mental factors associated with watching TV. There might be, um, you, I would suspect that the main issue is definitely uh, because you just sit and do not exercise, but we will see later on that the light will, for example, distract your uh, sleeping pattern. And by disrupting your sleeping pattern, you will be more at risk of cardiovascular disease and uh, potentially as well uh, diabetes. So there is probably a mental component as well. What is the proportion of it compared to just the non-physical activity? I'm not sure. 
But when you see that by just increasing for three hours per week your physical activity, you can reduce uh, enormously the appearance of diabetes. We know for a fact that this is probably the main reason. So how is uh, physical activity going to reduce the risk of diabetes? So there are def different um, factors. The first one is physical activity is associated with weight loss. However, we have to keep in mind that there's not much weight loss with physical activity. You need to usually combine weight loss with a healthy diet. And this will, uh, uh, make, sorry, you need to act to combine physical activity with a healthy diet to observe uh, a, a weight loss. And for example, we've just uh, performed a clinical study recently where we look at uh, obese women and um, we subjected them to uh, uh, three hours per week of intense um, dancing and, um, and we look after 14 weeks how much they had lost. But the, the diet was kept the same, everything was kept the same, it was just the physical activity. And in fact, they just lost in 14 weeks, I think something like 0.5 or you know, not even 0.5 kilos which they were all disappointed, of course, because they were actually doing intense uh, physical activity, and uh, yes, and it didn't really uh, affect the, the weight. Yes? No, they kept the diet exactly the same. That was recorded, so they, they were not uh, eating more. But it's sometimes, <laughs> it's, it's entirely true. You think so good, you've exercised, and then you say, oh, I can take that, I can take that. So you end up actually putting up Weight. Yes. 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 They did. They did. So actually, there was definitely a drop in the weight uh, uh, size. So the weight itself does not necessarily mean much. That's true. But we, on our side, I was interested in to looking at the uh, lipid profile, the good and bad cholesterol. So you will improve the insulin sensitivity, so you will actually improve that. We will look at the mechanism, but you will, for example, increase the, uh, the activity of your uh, glucose transporter 4. You will improve the uh, endothelial function, and that will be by different factors. We'll see it by either uh, re uh, increasing your nitric oxide, reducing the reactive oxygen species, uh, we will, it will improve your autonomic nervous system function. So that's actually very important because, for example, you will improve your uh, heart uh, function. And all of these will actually lower your risk of type 2 diabetes. And this will be mainly driven by a reduction in inflammation, a reduction of your oxidative stress. So, diabetes and Exercise impairment. So, if you are, if you have diabetes, how is this going to impact on your exercise performance? So, for for example, what will happen is that if you have diabetes, you will have a loss of your cardiorespiratory fitness. So you won't be as fit as uh, you uh, were if you didn't have diabetes, and it will actually impair on your exercise tolerance. So you won't be able to exercise as high or as uh, intensely than if you didn't have diabetes. You will actually, it will be, uh, um, you know, when you exercise, we've seen last year, you have an increase in your blood pressure, and this is actually going to, this increase will be uh, quicker or accentuated if you have diabetes. And the other issue is that you actually reduce your oxygen uptake by up to 15% because the capacity of your lung is reduced. So all these is because you have a reduced heart rate variability. We've seen you won't be able to uh, um, regulate your heart rate as easily as if you don't have um, diabetes. So this will definitely impact on your blood pressure. 
this will definitely impact on your cardiac performance. You will have a less yes. Why is your Okay, I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna come to that. So uh, you will have a less ventricular uh, a less ventricular uh, diastolic dysfunction. So diastolic is when you function at rest. So your heart will not be able to contract as well as uh, the if you don't have uh, uh, diabetes. And you will have a lower lung capacity. And this, remember, when you looked, you had the, the pulmonary system last year, and you have a regulation of your pulmonary system where your sympathetic and parasympathetic system. This is dysfunctional now. So you will end up with a lower lung capacity. And all of this will actually be associated with your reduce maximal <laughs> exercise capacity in patients with type 2 diabetes. So, are male and female uh, affected the same way? And this is a study that was uh, conducted uh, two, two, uh, three years ago. And what they wanted to see is whether the, the female are uh, actually affected the same way. We know that exercise in patients with uh, exercise performance is affected in patients with type 2 diabetes, but we wanted to check whether female were more affected than male. And uh, their conclusion was that there was definitely a greater abnormality in the female compared to the men. So that suggests that um, the hormones might play a role into it, but that's not sure. And that's actually, that was very interesting. But uh, I think we have to keep that with caution because that was performed in the patient and um, we already have a different baseline between male and female. And, okay, you may see a greater uh, uh, reduction, but how does really uh, have, uh, so it was a greater reduction in the uh, VO2 max, but actually, um, I think it depends on what type of exercise, and um, we know that there is a lot of differences between even women females or women men. But I think the the message here is really to uh, to suggest that uh, the hormones may play a role. And we also have to be very careful with this type of conclusion because female premenopause or, uh, or with menopause actually may react completely different. And this is an I a major issue, for example, in cardiovascular disease, where the female are more at risk or less at risk of cardiovascular disease. And the, the suggestion is, and I say suggestion because it's still open to debate, the suggestion is that actually female, when they're premenopause, they are less at risk of cardiovascular disease, but as soon as they become um, menopause, uh, then they become more at risk of cardiovascular disease. And we know that the estrogens uh, actually play a role um, with uh, cardiovascular disease. Okay, but what is important is that Diabetes exaggerates the exercise effort. So this is about how you perceive your, uh, the exercise and your exertion during exercise. And this is where we come back to whether the TV is it because of lack of exercise or is it a mental issue. And here, that's very interesting because they, would, they saw that actually patients with diabetes feel that exercise is more difficult than the uh, same type of patient which is not diabetic. So there is a mental aspect. So they definitely feel exhausted much quicker without having a physical um, reason for it. And so, so that is something to keep in mind. It's not just a mechanical aspect, it could be a mental aspect. 
So the benefits of exercise. So exercise uh, will favor weight loss, but it will also increase your muscle strength. It will improve your glucose control because it may restore part of the mechanisms of your insulin resistance. So it, it actually increases your insulin sensitivity. It will improve your cardiovascular fitness. So if you exercise regularly, it will actually improve, um, uh, of course, your cardiovascular system fitness. That means then you will improve your lung capacity and your cardiovascular function. It will improve your blood flow and your blood pressure, and this is because it will partly restore the um, vasoreactivity of your vessels. It will improve your cholesterol levels, so it will increase your HDL and reduce your LDL. But very important as well, it will release part of your stress and it will increase your feeling of well-being. And this is actually a, a very important component because if you have diabetes, um, you actually don't necessarily feel that um, you, your well-being is affected. But exercising will uh, have this effect of improving your well-being. And I think we all, in any case, um, feel the effect of well-being with exercise. And most of the time, you you go to the gym because you're on a discovery card, and you know that if you don't go three times per month, you're going to have to pay more the following month. So you feel, oh, I must go to the gym. and um, But you don't really want to go. But once you've done your exercise, you feel so good, and you feel like, Oh, I should do it much more often because it actually feels so nice. And this is definitely improving your well-being and your purse because then you don't have to pay more of the following So there are definitely six important mental health benefits of exercise. And the first one is why do you feel better after exercising? It's because it actually boosts your happy chemicals. And your happy chemicals are mainly your endorphins. And it releases some chemicals that make you happy. It will also help to reduce your anxiety. So there's nothing better than actually exercising before the exam. Because it will help you to refresh your mind and uh, release the stress, this anxiety. So it reduces your stress as well. And uh, it relaxes your muscles, it relieves tension in your body, whatever the type of exercise is. But it will also improve your self-confidence, because at the beginning you think, oh, I'll never be able to do it. And then you actually feel so much better that you feel like, yes, let's do it. It will also improve your workflow, so that, I'm not sure, apparently you will work much better if you exercise. So this is why in certain uh, companies they actually have a, a gym uh, center because apparently you will be much more uh, efficient uh, when you work uh, if you exercise every day, yes? Yeah? Yes. No, no, there is both physical and mental aspects. So oh, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to differentiate, and I think this is why the health benefit, mental health benefit, has, has been ignored for a long time. And it will be very difficult to differentiate um, what contributes. You can do some measurements when it's physical, but it's much more difficult to do some measurements when it's a mental. Uh, benefit. So I think it's a combination of both, definitely. And um, and we we have to remember that there is another environment. It's not just so easy to just exercise. Uh, imagine uh, could be a woman or a man, but in the middle of a divorce and uh, losing their job, you can exercise. Uh, I'm not sure these six 
uh, how benefits will have much impact on your uh, health if you have all these factors around you. So I, I think uh, in general, we've always been measuring the physical um, benefits. And we've kind of ignored the mental benefits. But today, we realize that these mental benefits actually are taking a much bigger proportion than expected. And um, the reason for it is probably because stress is increasing day by day. And I think this modern lifestyle, modern society, we are associated today with much more stress than we were before. And um, when, it, when you talk about women, it's even very difficult as well, because there has been an evolution in the lifestyle of women, which has probably changed even more compared to the men in the past 20, 30 years, when uh, before uh, women were not um, working as much as, I mean, there were not so many women working compared to today, and um, that definitely we can see, um, for example, in the in trend of cardiovascular disease, that there is a switch. And that's why I said it's still a debate, because it's very difficult to appreciate. Uh, I, the, the data takes very long to acquire and to check whether women are more at risk of cardiovascular disease compared to men. And all the data we had were, I think, data from 10 years ago. I'm sure there is a change if we take data from today. Because there have been a major change in the lifestyle of women with 10 years ago and today. And same for the men. But um, all this modern technology has actually brought a huge change in lifestyle. Whether it's phone, whether it's TV, whether it's um, computers. And um, today, most of the people spend hours in front of the computer and that's part of their job. That was not the case a few years ago. So it's very difficult to appreciate. Okay. And the, the, the last... Uh, Factor, health benefits that I, I will expand a little bit to more, not tomorrow, on Monday, is about the better sleep. And actually, exercise uh, improves your sleep. And we will see tomorrow how the sleep disturbance has a major effect on uh, the apparition of uh, cardiovascular disease. Okay, the development of cardiovascular disease. Okay, thank you. Enjoy your weekend. Let me. So this is a study that was actually published in 2016, and they they look at how the disruption of your sleeping pattern can actually increase your cardiovascular risk. And this was quite interesting. They they took some healthy patients, and uh, um, they uh, had. To, they were subjected to two protocols. On the top, what you can see is that actually they were asked to sleep, so they were at the hospital, and they were asked to sleep between 11 o'clock at night and 7 o'clock in the morning. And then they did several measurements. And a few weeks later, they were asked to actually uh, sleep uh, differently. So it was this uh, eight week, uh, eight day, sorry, protocol. And what you can see in the second part is that they actually first were asked to sleep between 11 and, uh, uh, in the evening and 7 uh, in the morning. And then after that, they were actually asked to sleep between 11 in the morning and 7 in the evening. So this is typically the, uh, the program of someone who works at night. So they wanted to see if this could actually increase your cardiovascular risk. So it was very interesting because only four days sleeping during the day instead of sleeping during the night actually change your blood pressure. And it actually increased your blood pressure. So in red are the, the patients that were what we say misaligned. So that means that were disrupted, the, the sleeping pattern was disrupted. And what you can see 
is that it actually disturbs the uh, sleeping pattern, but it also increased their blood pressure uh, at night when they were sleeping. So increase both the diastolic and the systolic pressure. So it's just four nights, and this you could see a change in their blood pressure. Yes, is that actually your the um, sympathetic and parasympathetic activation was disturbed. So that means if you have a parasympathetic and a sympathetic activation disturbed, you, it means you have a heart rate variability which is disturbed because remember your heart rate is regulated by your catecholamine, mainly your parasympathetic system. Okay? And this could also explain where you have an increase in blood pressure. Then, these patients, or healthy patients, that actually were asked to sleep during the day, they also have an increase in inflammatory markers. So, only four days of having to sleep during the day increase the interleukin 6 increase their TNF alpha, so all these inflammatory markers which actually were raised. So then you have an increase of inflammatory markers, so you're more at risk of disturbance and you're more at risk of cardiovascular disease. Yes? Um, what that's the message. The message is it increases. And that's the proof <laughs> for you to follow, yeah? I just want to know, obviously, you're going to take time to learn what's the right people to adapt to the disease and the practice. Okay, so that's a very good question. So what you mean is that if people always do that, will they adjust? Okay, so that means if, uh, for example, uh, people working in security, always night shift or nurses, if they always do that, Maybe they will, their sleeping patterns will be uh, in, in, will uh, change with all these different markers. But if they do that for 30 years, will it change their markers? So it's very difficult to answer to that question because it's epidemiology data, and there has been um, there has been a, a big study done on nurses, and for where they've been followed for years and years and years in the U.S. The problem is that. As I said, these changes may be due to the change in the sleeping pattern or they may be due to the change of different lifestyles. So you will never be able to prove. Here you could prove because actually the, the, the patients that came in, they were all asked to eat the same thing. They stayed at the hospital for eight days. They were asked to eat the same thing. They exactly had the same... Um, uh, occupations during the day. While uh, if you take uh, nurses, the difference might be explained by other uh, conditions. But epidemiology data clearly shows that when you uh, disrupt your sleeping pattern and when you work at night, you will actually increase your cardiovascular risk. So that's one thing. And the second thing is that, uh, got a blank, can't remember what I wanted to say. We'll come back. <laughs> but, but um, uh, yeah, so there's definitely, yes, what I wanted to say is that uh, this is also pro different from one individual to another individual. Um, so this is about the disruption of a sleeping pattern, but it doesn't take into account the number of of hours of sleep. A number of hours of sleep can also um, play a role in uh, increasing or decreasing your uh, cardiovascular risk. Uh, but the thing is, what we have to keep in mind is that some people need more or less sleep. It's very uh, function to the individual. So I think it's recommended that you need to sleep about six, seven hours. And then there have been some epidemiology data saying that if you sleep less, you increase your cardiovascular risk, and if you sleep more, it's exactly the same thing. <laughs> but again, 
uh, that can be linked to a different lifestyle. Okay, so um, circadian uh, misalignment, meaning when you change the time of uh, sleeping, this will definitely increase your inflammatory system. It will also increase all your lipid supply. It will change your lipid supply, and you will see that it will actually change your uh, uh, cholesterol levels. This can also impact on your cholesterol level. Plus, your cells will actually have a different behavior. And I'm sure you're going to see that uh, in the next few lectures is that actually each cell has its own circadian rhythm. And this has been discovered quite recently, but every cell itself uh, will be more or less efficient function to the time of the day. So this is becoming very, very complex. <laughs> okay, so now what we're going to see is how exercise can have an effect on insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. So we're going to see four uh, uh, effects. Um, is that exercise is going to reduce your reactive oxygen species. Exercise is going to reduce the glycated hemoglobin. Exercise is going to modulate your GRID4 translocation. And it's going to reduce your inflammation. So we're going to have a look at these four different mechanisms. So about reactive oxygen species, of ROS. So, how is exercise going to, uh, what will be the effect of exercise on your uh, oxidative stress? So, if you are, have a sedentary lifestyle, you always will produce nitric oxide. Eh? That is physiological. In physiological conditions, you always produce nitric oxide. If you're sedentary, you will produce some uh, reactive oxygen species, but you know that in your body, you actually have an endogenous system to be able to mop up these free radicals. Um, so this endogenous system are, for example, some enzymes such as superoxide dismethane. It can be catalase. These are enzymes that will actually uh, mop up your free radicals, which are toxic in your body. It could be the vitamin C, vitamin D, a strong antioxidant. So all of this will result, because you have some scavenger in your body, you may have production of nitric oxide, you have production, moderate production of rot, but you have enough scavengers to have a moderate oxidative stress in just normal conditions. If you if you uh, are sedentary but you not don't have too much stress or too much factors that come and uh, into it. If you do moderate exercise, what will happen? If you do moderate exercise, you will increase your nitric oxide, you will increase your scavenger, you will increase your rot. But the thing is because you're gonna increase more of your scavenger compared to your rust, you will end up with a reduction of your oxidative stress. So you are in a condition where your body is healthy and can actually uh, counterpart this increase of rust. However, if you exercise too much, you will increase so much the rust that your endogenous body won't be able, the scavengers won't be able to mop up all this oxidative stress, and you end up with an increase of oxidative stress. So, the, what is important here is that whether you do moderate exercise or whether you do strenuous exercise, you will actually end up with either a decrease of the oxidative stress or an increase of the oxidative stress. So you can straight away understand but actually, in diabetic patients, having strenuous exercise might actually not be a good thing. You want moderate exercise to be able to balance and reduce your oxidative stress. Okay? So, this is uh, um, 
looking at the mitochondrial respiration capacity in patients that are either healthy or diabetic. So in black here, this is measuring the, uh, the um, production of free radicals into your mitochondria. Because most of your uh, free radicals, uh, ROS, will be produced within the mitochondria. And in black here, these are diabetic patients that don't exercise. In white, these are healthy patients that don't exercise. And what you can see here is that actually there is already a more ROS produced, so there is an oxidative stress in the diabetic patients compared to the healthy patients with no exercise. And then this is a biopsy that was done in the muscle of uh, these patients. I think they were very brave. <laughs> To, to volunteer to do the research. And then what they did is they asked these patients to exercise. And what you can see here is that actually the, the diabetic patient, you see a reduction of the ex, uh, oxidative stress. So moderate exercise really reduced the oxidative stress, reduced the production of free radicals of reactive uh, oxygen species. And this reduction was not so uh, marked into the, the healthy patients because at the start they actually had a moderate uh, oxidative stress. And uh, of course, if they exercise moderately, you're not going to reduce by a lot the production of free radicals. Okay? So this is trying to bring the proof that actually moderate exercise will reduce the uh, oxidative stress in a diabetic patient. As I mentioned, um, exercise will also reduce the glycated hemoglobin. So we've discussed on Friday that with a diabetic patient, you have an increase of glycated products. And one of them is hemoglobin. Hemoglobin can be glycated, and if hemoglobin is glycated, it's not going to work well. And um, so you can actually use uh, glycated hemoglobin as a marker to try to see if you have an increase of glycated hemoglobin in your body. In theory, it's, uh, it's actually going to show you whether you've got uh, a blood um, glucose. Um, a high blood glucose level, but actually it's not a good marker. It can't really be used as a marker for uh, reflecting your blood glucose level because remember hemoglobin has a lifespan of three months, 120 days. So that means what you're going to measure will reflect uh, three months of your uh, uh, blood levels. So it's actually not, it's a poor marker. So here, these are more or less the, the results that you would expect to see whether you are normal, pre-diabetes or diabetes. So they've been trying to use that as a marker, but actually it's a very poor marker because it will only, uh, it won't really reflect a, um, a change within the past three months. So... Exercise, nevertheless, will actually reduce the glycated hemoglobin. But remember, because I just said um, and your hemoglobin will leave for three months, you, uh, you will actually, if you do just an acute exercise, you won't be able to see anything. Because it's just one day, and that's not going to change much. Uh, but... If you actually do regular exercise, in that case, you, you will be able to, do, to see a change in your glycated hemoglobin. So for several months, every day, you will see something. And the recommendation is 150 minutes per day week or three days a, a week uh, to, of moderate to vigorous exercise. We'll see later the recommendation. So, exercise will also improve your grid force expression. So, remember, insulin normally will bind to its receptor. It will activate multiple signaling cascades, and it will actually activate the translocation of your grid 4 
um, uh, of grid four into the, the membrane. But uh, if you have uh, type 2 diabetes and you do exercise, so in type 2 diabetes you have reduced grid 4 expression, but if you exercise, you will be able to increase your grid 4 to a similar level to healthy people. So it is really uh, beneficial. And because it's going to increase your GLUT4 expression, that will actually um, result in an improve of your glucose uptake and your glycemic regulation. So this is really a benefit. So it can bypass the insulin and it can target directly the GLUT4 uh, translocation. However, exercise will bypass this mechanism, and this is the beauty of it. Exercise will use the purple pink mechanism. And what exercise is going to do, it's actually going to activate AMP kinase. And it's going to activate your calcium calmodulin dependent protein kinase. And both of these kinases can actually improve GLUT4 translocation. So the beauty of it is that it completely bypasses the signaling of insulin. It acts by its own uh, uh, kinases to improve GLUT4 translocation. So you've got both AMP kinase and calcium calmodulin dependent kinase. So, insulin will also, uh, sorry, exercise will also reduce your inflammation. And here, for example, this is a study that has been done in rats. And what they've been able to do is they measure different inflammatory markers, such as TNF, interleukin 1 beta, interleukin 6. And what they did here is they had either sedentary rats or they ask the rats to exercise. So I don't know what type of exercise they ask the rats to do, but normally it's either running on the wheel or it's swimming. And what they could see is that in grey it's sedentary. And what they could see is the diabetic rats already had an increase of inflammatory markers without exercising compared to the control. But as soon as they were asking their animals to actually exercise, they saw a, a, a clear reduction of all the inflammatory markers. So it's really nice because exercise will definitely reduce inflammation, whether it's in a physiological condition, sedentary condition, or diabetic patients. Diabetes will improve your mitochondrial activity. And what is happening in diabetes? So you have an overload of free fatty acids, you have hyperglycemia, and all of this we've seen before is going to increase your reactive oxygen species. So reactive oxygen species are toxic chemicals, and they're actually going to increase different mutations, leading to a dysfunction of many functions. They're going to reduce the mitochondrial biogenesis, so you're going to produce less mitochondria. And they accelerate all the aging process. So that will result in a dysfunctional mitochondria, which means you're going to produce less ATP. You're going to further increase the ROS because now your mitochondria, which is your uh, main component producing ROS, they're dysfunctional and they produce even more ROS. And it reduces your beta oxidation. So this will really lead to insulin resistance and this will favor 
cardiovascular disease. However, so this is um, the general mechanism. What we have to remember is that actually the mitochondria is a very dynamic structure. So yes, you're going to you're going to reduce the synthesis of the biogenesis of your mitochondria. So less mitochondria will be produced. But on top of that, you're actually going to change the type of mitochondria you've got. And actually, diabetes will, re will result in smaller size mitochondria. So you will have less mitochondria and mitochondria that actually are dysfunctional. And what you need to remember is that mitochondria, it's a dynamic structure, and they can actually be subjected to either fusion, so my two mitochondria can actually combine together, that's the phenomenon called fusion, or they can actually go under fission, meaning one mitochondria can actually split in two mitochondria. So this is a phenomenon that always happens in your body. Your mitochondria will either split in two, or two mitochondria will uh, join together to form a single mitochondria. So it's a fusion or a fission process. And what is happening with diabetes is that actually you're going to favor the fission process, which means you're going to favor the formation of smaller mitochondria. So you, you're going to actually favor the split of the mitochondria. So in theory you will think, oh, but that then means there will be more mitochondria. But no, because you have actually a decrease in a biogenesis, and also we're going to split in smaller mitochondria, there will actually be, in total, there will be much less mitochondria. Much less and smaller mitochondria. And these are really dysfunctional mitochondria. And then on the other side, you will have a decrease of a factor that we call peroxidum proliferator activator receptor gamma co-activator 1 alpha or PGT1 alpha. I'm sure you've heard of PGT1 alpha before, which is much simpler, but that's actually what it means. <laughs> and the decrease of PGT1 will actually lead to protein degradation and this is actually what is going to result as well to the decrease in biogenesis because pgc one alpha is a, an important factor required for the biogenesis of your mitochondria. So you decrease the biogenesis and you decrease the functionality of your mitochondria. However, if you exercise, exercise is the best way to increase your PGC1. So exercise will increase your PGC1 alpha and that will result in an increase of your mitochondrial biogenesis. So great. So you will actually be able to restore the biogenesis of your mitochondria with exercise. And exercise has another characteristic is that it will facilitate the fusion of your mitochondria. So diabetes facilitates the fission, but exercise facilitates the fusion. So it will definitely not only increase the biogenesis, but it will increase the quality of your mitochondria. So, whether you exercise um, with high intensity or high volume of training, you will have different mechanisms that will be activated. So, the high intensity of training will actually increase the AMP, and this will actually activate your AMP kinase. Why? The high volume of training will increase your calcium availability and that will actually increase your calcium calmodulin 
kinase, but as I mentioned earlier, both of them will actually activate your PGC1 alpha, and PGC1 alpha has multiple benefits. It will increase your mitochondrial biogenesis. It will also increase your type 1 fibers. You've seen the different types of fibers, eh? Uh, of muscles. So you, you, I'm sure you know more than I do on this because I'm sure you had quite a lot of detailed uh, lectures on the muscles and exercise. So it will increase your fat oxidative capacity. It increases your glucose, GLUT4 transportation and your glycogen. So really multiple benefits of exercise via PGC1 alpha. So, AMPK kinase and PGC1 alpha important um, with exercise to improve all your performance. But how is this also happening in diabetic patients? So definitely, what has been seen is that in patients type 2 diabetes that are non-obese patients, it seems like the AMPK uh, activity is normal, so it's not reduced, which is good. However, if type 2 diabetes patient with obesity, you have a lower AMPK kinase activity. So that means the mechanisms that we've seen earlier might not be so efficient in type 2 diabetic patients that are obese. And we know as well that there's a difference between men and women and the uh, AMPK activity is actually lower in women. So, possibly obese patients with type 2 diabetes will have to train a little bit harder to be able to increase significantly their uh, AMP kinase activity. With regard to PGC1 alpha, it sounds like um, both healthy and type 2 diabetic patients can increase PGSC1 alpha in the same way. And that actually uh, there wouldn't be uh, a disruption by, due to type 2 diabetes of the activity of PGC1 alpha in type 2 diabetes. So now, there is clear evidence that uh, exercise is beneficial for uh, type 2 diabetes patients. It will increase insulin sensitivity, uh, uh, insulin resistance, sorry. But now, um, what should you recommend? How, how exercise should you recommend? And this is actually still a major debate. And uh, there are some guidelines. But actually trying to uh, uh, explain whether you should do more aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, the frequency, the intensity, the, the duration and the mode of exercise. But actually there's a large evolution at the moment. Most of it is based on epidemiology data and actually there are a lot of controversies. So uh, it still has to be taken with caution, but it's clear that you mustn't go for too much exercise because actually you may have a reverse effect of increasing your oxidative stress. Yes? Uh, you, sensitivity, sorry. <laughs> yes, which is completely the opposite. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, you improve your insulin uh, sensitivity and decrease insulin resistance. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, um, now the, the general recommendation is to say that you should do three days a week with no more than two consecutive days. And uh, um, but actually the guidelines talk about five days a week. So really, I think there is no rule. And it's very much dependent on the individual. Uh, because 
every diabetic patient or healthy patient will react differently towards exercise. I think that one of the risks is to go through hypoglycemia because actually the type 2 diabetes patient will take drugs, medication, but actually you just need to make sure that you don't actually uh, become hypoglycemia and this is why sometimes they have to take sugar to actually <laughs> uh, counter the hypoglycemic uh, insult due to the medication. But this usually can be uh, controlled very well and uh, the patient itself knows its limits. Okay, so to finish I would just like to talk to you about exercise in the field. So for those who don't want to exercise, after we've seen that exercise really seems to benefit type 2 diabetic patients, there seems to be a new drug that's going to come on the market, um, well, which has been uh, studied recently, and I don't know when it will come on the market, but uh, which seems to be very promising. So it's called exercise in the pill, uh, where you can actually in increase your uh, endurance capacity, you can mimic the effect of exercise, by just staying in the, in, in the couch or watching TV. <laughs> also remember, then if the pill um, starts, if the pill might increase the, the exercise performance, I'm not sure it can actually play on the mental side of what exercise can bring you. <laughs> so just uh, briefly, so usually when you do, and you've seen that before, endurance sports, you actually, it's going to be the carbohydrate depletion that will be the significant determinant of performance. So once you have depleted your carbohydrate, this is where you're going to stop running. And um, exercise training actually enhances your uh, endurance, and this is in part by trying to delay the, the depletion of carbohydrate uh, stores. And um, this is what the pill is aiming at, is to try to delay the carbohydrate uh, store. So we know that at the same time what exercise is going to do, it's going to enhance your muscle fatty acid oxidation, which in theory could actually provide uh, um, extra energy substrate to actually extend your performance time and that will reduce your dependence of glucose. So you're trying to find another source of energy to be able to uh, uh, compensate the depletion of glucose. So what? Okay, I think any questions.